All right. So welcome back. Okay. So we have lots to say today. So let's get into it. Any questions? Any comments? Give me a second, sorry, to answer this phone. Okay, sorry about that. I was just answering the phone. So, so I, today I want to continue talking about hardware security. If you remember, I said, you know, the story we started with, with sensors and environments and faults and software. And then we said that, okay, at the, all, all these things, we didn't really consider hardware as the source of problems. We kind of did with faults, but not really the source of the problem could be hardware. Uh, I, I said that there are three issues that we need to kind of be worried about and think about. The first one is the hardware is not performing what it's supposed to. We kind of learned a little bit about this throughout this class when we were talking about faults. Uh, but there are other two things. One is what we call hardware trojans, which is essentially these intentional manipulation of the hardware uh, that could cause lots of problems that we're going to talk about today. And the third thing is, is the design bugs that similar to software, there are some wrong assumptions, wrong implementations that can cause problems in our systems. I'm going to particularly talk about so like this very big thing in uh, you know, hardware yeah, uh, computer architecture community B, that is transient execution attacks. You probably have heard about uh, Spectre and Meltdown. These are the examples of transient execution attacks. Uh, so later now, you know, hopefully we, we will get time to, to talk about this. If not, I'll probably just, you know, record a short video and post it online. Uh, the second issue is more information leakage issue. So same as software, the hardware could be the IP of a particular company or designer, right? So you want to protect that as the designer, as the owner of that. Uh, things like IP piracy or reverse engineering or mass production, un, you know, uh, unauthorized production. These are the problems that we might have. I'm going to also talk about this and, uh, and one way of protecting the system against this uh, using hardware metering and, and obfuscation. And then finally, uh, there's kind of like an integrity-ish problem, which is counterfeit and age hardware. That is like you're not getting what you're supposed to get. You are getting like a used kind of hardware. Um, and then, as I said, collection of these, you know, integrity and, and uh, protecting privacy and Trojan is usually called, uh, you know, hardware supply chain security. So the majority of this lecture would be around these different topics about supply chain security in general, okay? Uh, as I said, these things we're not going to talk about in that that is like also relevant and that's like how do we do hardware, you know, storage and, and designing TPMs and tamper resistance and so on. Uh, one thing that we discussed a little bit last time was about this part and PUFs. I'm going to actually start with that and finish that before jumping into hardware supply chain security. Uh, so if you remember, the last thing that I said last time was, I mean, if I want to store keys, uh, what can I do? And I, I told you that, you know, one of the biggest problem is that if I actually physically store the keys, I'm opening the door for various different, you know, attacks, physical attacks, tampering attacks, because the adversary can breed this, you know, secret values, right? So one solutions that can help us, <coughs> excuse me, of course, this is not the only solution, and one of the popular solutions is uh, this physical unclonable functions or PUFs, which the idea is that we're not going to store the key, we're going to generate the key dynamically on the fly, right? So how do we do that? We get an input, which we usually call a challenge. Based on the input, we're going to create the key on the fly, okay? So let's see how we're going to do that. So the desire, you know, model, desire, uh, functionality of a PUF is the system that is what we say it's easy to uh, 
It's easy to measure, but it's hard to predict, right? Measure means that the actual user can easily generate the key given a, a particular challenge. But if the adversary sees the challenge without access to the PUF, they should not be able to detect the key, right? So the prediction is, is in this sense. Because if the adversary can predict easily, then they can predict the key easily, and then the entire thing will work, right? So that's kind of like, you know, uh, quite intuitive and obvious kind of requirements. So how do we build PUFs? The fundamental idea is that we are building on this uh, fundamental fact that if I build different hardware, each one gonna have unique characteristics and I'm gonna use that unique characteristics somehow. I'm gonna design something that's gonna leverage that unique characteristics in order to build uh, you know, a PUF system. Okay, uh, and then the interesting thing about this physical characteristics is that uh, the replicating them is very, very hard, nearly impossible. As in like, if I know the characteristics of this particular hardware, for example, if I know the gate delays of all the logics that exists in this hardware, I cannot really build another hardware with the exact same characteristics, even though I know the numbers, okay? Why? Because the process of building like logic gates is, 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 is a random process. It's a very, very noisy process and you cannot really control that, okay? As a result, when I'm building a hardware and measure the numbers, I'm kind of guaranteeing that nobody can replicate this. And that's, that's a very important and strong capability that I'm gonna have. The nice thing about this is also that I can measure this physical characteristics pretty trivially, right? I can, I can, for example, measure the delays uh, and, and, and other physical characteristics if I want to. And essentially predicting them since this is more mathematically becomes kind of a, a random process. Uh, I cannot really predict a random process if it's, if it's large, you know, sample size. So it's basically becomes a brute force problem. It's like a detecting the password. So same issue is going to be there. So these three, you know, capabilities, functionalities give us the security that we want in a PUF system. How do we build PUF systems? Last time I kind of like, you know, break this down for you. And essentially said that, you know, the fundamental thing is that we have this different columns. Each one is, let's say, two different gates. In this particular case, it's a MUX. And what happens is that there will be two paths, like one path here and one path here. And I'm applying the exact same input to, to, to both of the paths. But since the delay of this path is different than the delay of this path, the time it takes for this you know, kind of pulse uh, to get here is different than this. So this is, for example, T1, this is T2. And there are two possibilities, right? So if T2 is bigger than T1, then data arrives first before the, the clock arrives. So in this case, the output would be equal to one. If T1 is bigger than T2, it means that the clock arrives, but the data hasn't yet. So the, the output would be zero, right? So based on the difference between these two paths, I'm gonna have a different output, which is Y. And as I said, if I you know build this multiple times, each time uh, the output would be either zero or one, okay? So what I can do is that, for example, if I want to have a four-bit response, I can replicate this four times. So think about this in, in Y direction. I'm gonna basically, like if this is one circuit, I'm gonna build another circuit and another circuit and another circuit. Uh, and each one has their own Ys. So this would be, for example, Y0, this is Y1, this is Y2. This is Y3. And then each one is kind of independent from each other and it could be zero or one. So essentially my output would be a four bit number that could be zero, 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 one, all the way to one, 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 right? Two to the power of four different outputs. I can do this N times and I'm gonna get two to the power of N different outputs, right? So this is how I'm gonna generate the size that I want. I, I want, for example, uh, 128 bits, uh, I'll just replicate this 128 bit times. And since each of these are unique and different from the other, their activity, their behavior is kind of random. So we are basically saying that there will be a random process 
that 50% of the time it could be zero, 50% of the time would be one. And then the distribution among this random distributions basically give me the answer. Okay, that's kind of like what we're getting. Uh, next thing is that what's the role of this challenge? Because what it seems that this is basically regardless of what input I give, the output would be either zero or one, right? So nothing changes. So if I change the challenge, this path and this path doesn't change. So, so it's not like a function of inputs. But as, as, I, as I told you, usually what we want to have is something like this, that I give a different challenge, I get a different response, okay? So how do we do that? For example, for this particular case, we're gonna use this very interesting trick that as you can see here, um, the, the inputs are kind of like, you know, mixed and match in some way. Uh, so what is really happening here is, as you can see, for example, there is this path that zero goes here, then this either goes here or here, and then goes here, and then all the way here, 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 here. So if you actually see that there is this challenge, which is, let's say, for example, four bit in this case, that's, you know, bit zero goes to the selector of these two muxes. Uh, the bit one goes to the selector of these two muxes and so on and so forth. And what these muxes do, essentially, if the selector is zero, means that this path, the top path is selected. If, if the, you know, the, path, the, the selector is equal to one, it means that this path is selected. So essentially, the path becomes this. Right, so the value here either coming from this red path or coming from this blue path, and as you can see, they, these are two different you know gates and different different combination of gates. If I if I continue this, is you will see that for example, this one is maybe connected to here, versus this one, the blue one is kind of continuing this path. So for example, this gate and this gate is different. So what I'm doing is that by changing the challenge. I'm kind of picking different permutations or combination of these gates. So for example, in one case, this gate, this gate, this gate, and this gate are selected. In another case, this gate, this gate, this gate, and this gate is selected and so on and so forth. I can basically pick any four, uh, like any two from each, each kind of column, okay? So why does this matter? Because essentially when I'm changing the challenge, I'm changing the equivalent path of these two uh, D and Q. So now for, for some path, this might be faster. For some other path, this might be faster. And going back to this, like, you know, replicating this n times, now I'm applying challenge for this one. And then for each one, different path would be selected. In other words, by changing the challenge, I'm changing the path and I'm changing the response. And, and this challenge is basically deciding what response I'm getting. Right, so this is kind of making this input dependent as well, right? And then if I'm building this hundred times, there will be hundred different hardware, each one different, you know, a random response. Uh, so even for a given for the same challenge, the responses for this different hardware would be different. Okay, so so this is kind of like how we build this. So essentially, so uh, it will be different hardware, hardware one. Harvard two, three, and so on and so forth. And within each, there is a path that each path is basically 128 bits. Uh, so I'm gonna apply the same challenge to eat all of them. And what I'm gonna get is a different response for each one. So this is response, for example, two, this is response one. And even though I'm applying the same challenge, so they say zero, 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 or zero, 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 one. Since these devices are not the same, you know, hardware, the response is this Y zero, Y one, Y two would be different, okay, for each one. So that's why I'm going to get a unique response. So this response and this response are not going to be equal to each other because they're hardware. Is and the second thing is that if I change this challenge to challenge number two, then the response two would be different than response one per device. So these two won't be equal to each other. And of course, they won't be equal to each other as well. So like any two combination would be done. Does that make sense? Any questions?
Cool. So we call this an arbiter path or silicon path. Essentially, the idea is that I'm I'm building this uh, I'm building this hardware, and and this hardware will gonna give me the the delay that I want. Okay. And and essentially, when I'm changing the, the 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 circuits, when I'm rebuilding this multiple times, I'm gonna get different responses. And in this way, I can I can know that which which device uh, you know which response which is which. Okay. And then, as you can see, the measurements of this is pretty quick. It's basically all we need to do is applying kind of like a pulse response and gets just gather this like you know y zero to y n values so very quick to generate these keys and that's exactly what we want but for the adversary in order to predict this y zero y one y two etc etc they need to either have the model of this knowing exactly what are those delay values otherwise they need to basically predict the delay of each one as i told you already this is a random process so it's basically just detecting a random value okay so for example for 128 bits the chances that they can you know detect it correctly is one to the power of 128 very very small number right so that's kind of like where the security is coming from any questions yeah so this is like kind of an epic okay, for that reading message, right? this is no this is not epic yeah, i don't think we have any paper for pufs unfortunately Oh, but the concept is similar. Or I think in Epic they use QFs as. Yeah, I'm gonna actually get to Epic uh, soon, right? Uh, you can use PUF for authenticating devices. So I'm gonna actually get to use cases of PUF, and one of them is, for example, if you want to distinguish devices from each other, one way of doing that is authenticating these devices, right? So if you know, for example, for this given challenge. This device has to give this response. The other device has to give that response. Maybe I can use it for, for you know, detecting, IDing, identifying each of these devices. So just make sure. So once you get the key, is that the slot from like being a pirate and keep on copying this on Apple? Now you have the right key, right? Yes. Uh, I'm gonna get to the to the to okay. the to that part. So so it will be more clear once they happen. Any other questions? Okay, so there are three things that we're kind of looking for in, in a POF system. Uh, a uniqueness, uniformity, and reliability. What is uniqueness? Uniqueness, or in other words, kind of independence means that, you know, if I send the same challenge, okay, to device one and device two, obviously the responses should be different. So R1 and R2. So you want to have different responses. You want to have independent responses, unique responses for each of these challenge, okay? Uh, because in that case, then you can, for example, use this for key generations and so on. If these are not the same, then attacker can basically get their hands to device two and then basically attack device one because device two becomes the perfect replicate as device one. And I already told you that, you know, generally PUF is gonna give you this property because Essentially, process variation is this random process that's kind of change, and then you build it that way to make sure that this uniqueness property is held. Okay. The second thing is uniformity. Uh, uniformity means that you probably want to have a uniform response of of combination of zeros and ones, and each one you want to be also uniform. So within each bit and across the bits, you want to have uniform. Uh, uh, distribution, which means that for every single bit, the chances that this bit is zero or one should be close to 50%. And then the number of zeros and number of ones across the response should be also 50%. Because if it's not the case, then the adversary can basically predict that, uh, you know, bits with maybe the chance better than random guessing, better than, better than 50%, right? So you want to have a uniform response that for a different challenge, different responses provided and kind of the responses are kind of equally distributed in terms of zeros and ones and their own distributions. Remember when we were talking about generating keys and messages, we said the same thing in order to achieve semantic security. This is exactly the same concept. So it actually goes into semantic security and the reasons for that. And finally, reliability. Reliability means that if I send the same challenge to device one, 
I should get response one. If I repeat this process many times, every time I send the exact same challenge, I should get the exact same response. So within the same device, for the given challenge, for the same challenge, if I repeat this many times, I should get exactly the same response. Otherwise, there's no way that I can use this for something useful. Because if the response for the same challenge changes, then there is no way that we can say that, okay, this is device one or device two or device three, okay? So it has to be reliable as well. And as I'm going to talk about a little bit later, just reliability is kind of the biggest challenge in, in PU of systems because these are delay-based systems. And if you know a little bit about the analog design and digital design, Delays change with temperature, delays change with workload. So delay actually like, you know, very impacted a lot by the, the environments. And as a result, you know, this delays might changes and the response might change as well. So you need to actually be a little bit careful when you're designing the PUF systems. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's talk about the application of PUF. Uh, I already talked about key generations. Usually what we do for key generations is what we call the weak puff. So weak in this case is not, it means that this, their security is weak. It's just a, it's a word that we use. The reason for this is that typically weak PUF just take very small number of challenges. So for example, in this case, I showed you that essentially I can have an n bit or m bit challenge, okay? And if this m is large, it means that I have a very large space for challenge and responses. For a weak puff, you usually don't have this. You typically have, for example, one bit challenge for, uh, or two bit challenge. The reason for this is that you want to have, for example, a single key in your system. For example, you want to use AES. You don't want to have like 100 different keys. All you need is one key that is secure and cannot be read by the adversary, right? So there are ways to build weak puff easier than strong puff, as I'm going to talk about in the next slide. As a result, you may want to have, you know, you want to build weak puff. And the main use case for this is key generations. Usually we don't use the puff, the output of the PUF directly for keys. What you would usually do is like, you know, you add additional things like fuzzy extractor, et cetera, et cetera, to use it for key. The reason for that is uh, key, cryptography keys needs to have additional, you know, characteristics. Like, you know, it has needs to have, you know, perfect uniqueness. There are other things that we need to be careful when we are using it for key. So usually the PUF output goes into another, you know, uh, 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 unit called fuzzy extractor that I'm not going to talk about. And this is actually giving us the key. Just remember that there's kind of post-processing after the PUF response in order to get your keys. Uh, don't worry about it, what they are. If you're interested, go and read about it. But generally, a weak PUF is something that only has kind of one bit of challenge is either zero or one. And, uh, and it's very, very hard to predict and easy to, 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 to design and usually very robust because then it's, it's only zero or one. So it's very good, you know, candidate for key generations, okay? Uh, example of this is, for example, power on state of an SRAM. So SRAMs is this memory states, right? that when they're off, they're actually not storing anything. When they're on, they can be randomly assigned to zero or one really, okay? And each one could be either zero or one. Uh, so, and then people have shown that this is almost truly random. So what will happen is that you can basically, you know, turn off your restaurant, turn it on again, and get that value, and that could be your secret. And this is device dependent, which means that if I build the same SRAM many times, the responses are different. And it's pretty robust because essentially the same SRAM will have the same power on state all the time. And, and this is really good candidate, for example, for key generation. So you don't really need to store the keys. All you need to do is knowing that what is, for example, your power on state of your SRAM. That's kind of like what you do. And this is very secure against side channels attacks because if the device is off, nobody can read it. If the device is on, you don't really, you know, expose the, the internal data of your SRAM to the outside world. So again, you're protected against side channels attacks. 
Okay. And the alternative for 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 PUFs is for authentication, which actually that epic paper is kind of also using this. The difference is that here we're going to have a large set of CRPs. CRP is challenge response peers. So we call this a strong PUF because we, it supports lots of challenges and lots of responses. Uh, uh, the usefulness of this is that it's useful for kind of IDing. If you want to ID many, many different devices, then a weak PUF wouldn't help. You need to have different challenges and different responses because you keep seeing this, right? So it's kind of like a one-time use kind of password. So you send it, you get a challenge, you, get a, you send a challenge, you get a response. Uh, you use it, but the next time if you send the same challenge, you're going to get the same response, so you cannot use it anymore, so it's kind of like a nonce problem, so you have to send another challenge and get another response, so that's why you need a large pair of challenge and responses in order to use this. Uh, one big problem with strong PUF is that they are, they are vulnerable to this machine learning modeling attacks, so what people have shown is that if there is a PUF that takes a challenge and provide a response, people have found that if I see a lots of challenge response pairs, okay, lots of these, what I can do is that this is the perfect example of a machine learning problem, which what I'm going to do is sending this challenge as the input, and using this Rs as kind of like the output of the classifier. So I'm gonna train this machine learning system and saying that, okay, this challenge should be this response. This challenge should be this response. This challenge should be this response. Go and learn the underlying mapping between the challenge and responses. Although I don't know the numbers, I'm gonna force this machine learning algorithm like something like a deep neural network or SVM, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of learn the underlying mapping so that the next time I see a challenge, a new challenge, although I don't know the response, I'm going to feed it into this machine learning and hopefully this will give me the response. And this response might be correct. If this is correct, if it's the same as what is the, 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 the PUF going to give me, then I'm essentially breaking this PUF, right? So I can attack this PUF. So this is one of the key challenges and key problems in strong puffs. That's why we need to make sure that our system is actually robust against this machine learning attack. So there are lots of research on breaking new machine learning attacks for this puffs. And then there are lots of research on kind of protecting the systems against machine learning. Attacks. So it's kind of like, you know, back and forth uh, kind of, you know, studies on this. Um, so as I said, the security of these depends on the application, the two main application, key derivation, key generation. Here you're only using one challenge. Here you're using many challenges. And here the security based on this fact that you only use challenge once. So each challenge has, has to be only used once. Otherwise, the next time you're sending a challenge, the adversary already seen that response, so they can actually do the replay. So, so you only can use any challenge once for authentication, but for key generation, since there is no challenge, the challenge is basically a binary value, then you're, you're good to go. But it's only one response this PUF can generate for you. They, they cannot be multiple responses. Okay? Awesome. Uh, so the biggest challenge, as I said, for PUF is dealing with the noise. The reason for this is that uh, the environment changes, the temperature changes, the voltage changes. And once the voltage and temperature changes, the delay will change. Okay, And if delay change, then the entire thing basically changes. Because remember, the response is basically a function of you know, gate delays. If I change the gate delays, the response will be different. And remember, I want to have robustness, right? Robustness means that if I send the same challenge, I should get the same response. If like 10 minutes from now, I send the same challenge, I should get the same response. Otherwise, the system won't be useful at all. Okay, but from here to here, if, for example, the temperature changes, if the voltage changes, there might be a different response, and that's what uh, we don't want. So we need to be able to kind of 
have some tolerance to the noise and build the system such that we can kind of like you know protect our systems against this noise okay uh how do we do that there are two ways that we kind of protect our systems against noise the first one is error correction so those of you who are familiar with like you know communication systems communication systems also have the same issue the challenge the channel is noisy you know signals might be flipped and dropped so what you would do is using error correction codes you probably have heard about like you know ECH and and you know single error correction double error detection uh parity bits these are you know there are lots of works on you know coding theory how do we detect code uh, errors how we protect codes errors and so on and so forth so you can apply all these different techniques to to your data such that you can then detect these errors okay uh so it becomes like a very kind of information theory kind of problems and there are lots of works in this domain that is applicable here the second thing that people do is using differential dependency so the idea is this that if i if i have a puf here and if i send a challenge and get a response since for example the temperature changes and the delay changes right what i can do is that i can have something like this So what is happening here is I don't directly looking at the response here. I'm kind of replicating this twice and looking at the difference, okay? The reason that looking at the difference is helpful is that if, for example, the temperature rises, this one rise and this one rise, but the difference, the differential effect is almost zero, right? So if both of them goes up, the delay of both of them goes up, the difference is still the same. If both of them goes down, the difference is still the same. So the idea is that I'm not gonna look, you know, look into one path, I'm, I'm looking at the difference between the two paths. And since these two paths are impacted by the same environment because they're on the same chip. So if the temperature changes, if the voltage changes, both of them might go up or might go down, but their differences is still the same thing because they are impacted in the same ratio. Okay, so differential dependency is, is like one of the tricks that we use in PUF. It's actually using many many different analog signals, like you know differential power amplifiers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which we're not really looking at the absolute values. We're looking at the differences and try to amplify that difference. Okay, so this way I'm going to make my system very robust against uh, environments. Okay. Uh, like when we are using the error correction, so the output of the clock should be like a uh, 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 encoding moment of the key. Yes, exactly. So when you are using error correction, for example, if you want to have you know eight bits, probably you want to do like ten bits or nine bits. So your PUF generate nine bits and one bit become the parity and then you fix, for example, one error. So then you have to some encoding. That's why it's actually like in one of the reasons that uh, you don't do this directly is exactly this. So this fuzzy extractor is actually understanding that encoding and do the error correction for you, right? So uh, yeah, it's very same as the way you do error correcting any other system. Thank you. Questions? Okay. So there are a whole bunch of other questions. Uh, PUF is actually kind of like, you know, a, a concept that's been uh, around for some time. So it's more established than the other area of research. But like, how do we, how do we make PUF low overhead? How to make it faster? How to make it like strong? and then robust against machine learning attacks, uh, how we can use new technologies to build POF. So these are kind of like research questions that that's, you know, it's been around recently and, and, and POF is still something that's being used uh, a lot in, in research. Any questions about POF? Okay. 
Uh, similar concept to PUF is RNGs or random number generators. Uh, the reason that we need random number generators is that for many, many cryptography tasks and that we discuss in this class, we need like, you know, a random number. We need an initialization seed, we need a nonce, we need an initialization vector, and all of them starts with some random number. And we can either ask this random number from outside externally, like, you know, a server generates this random number and send it to us, or we can generate this on the fly on the hardware. So uh, it's usually very handy and useful to have a random number generator on, on chip on the hardware itself, okay? Uh, but what we really need to have is true random number generator. The true means that it's actually passed some statistical tests of uniformity, uniqueness, variation, and so on and so forth. So for example, if you want to use it for a cryptography key, a pseudo random number generator is a very bad idea. What you need to have is, is an actual, you know, true random number generator. Okay, uh, and and so you need a true random number generator, but since you're gonna use it a lot in your hardware, it has to be low power, it has to be fast, it has to be low overhead area as well. Uh, so how do we usually do that? We typically use some physical phenomena to generate this for us, okay? Uh, you know, things like thermal noise, the photoelectric effect, quantum effect, these are the things that you pick, pick, typically use when you are when you're building a true random number generator in hardware uh, there are you know various different you know interesting ideas here of how you actually you know build a true random number generator but typically based on some true source of randomness that you can actually create uh, and build your random number generator uh, we have to be very very careful because uh, you know things like you know Linear, you know, shift registers and etc. They're not useful for true random number generators because these are pseudo random number generators and not true random number generators. Uh, so, so be careful about like you know what we are using. So there are lots of you know interesting stories about like casinos who are using pseudo random generators for their you know uh, for their roller games and so on and so forth. And if they're not true random numbers, then an attacker can observe a sequence of that and then predict the next number, which means that, for example, in Roland, if you can you know, predict the next number, you kind of can you know, uh, win a lot of money, right? So, you know, there's actually, you know, direct uh, relationship between having a true random number generator and the attacks the attacker can do. Lots of interesting papers on how they can break this assumption and, and attack the systems. If you're interested, go and take a look. But generally, this is uh, one of those areas that there are lots of research on what other physical phenomena that we can use in order to generate two random number generators. One that is actually quite active these days is quantum. So one of the actual kind of near-term use cases of quantum computers and quantum devices is for two random number generators. There are some startups actually recently have uh, get familiar to that you're kind of trying to build this on a on a cell phone in order to kind of replace it with the existing systems and so on and so forth. Huh? So that's kind of the summary of two random number generators and PUF. Uh, the idea here is that we're going to use some hardware primitives uh, to help us with some of the security problems that we have, right? to solve some security problems, right? Uh, and then, as I said, there are other things such as CPM, trusted execution environments, uh, uh, tamper resistant, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about some of them in the class. Uh, some of them, if you're interested, definitely go on and take a look, okay? So now going back to the hardware supply, ch supply chain security, uh, uh, let's have it like a two minute break. I need to uh, answer my phone and then I'll be back and then we're gonna talk about this, okay? All right. So now let's talk about Halbert's hardware supply security. If you remember, I told you that, you know, attacks and defenses during the, the design and manufacturing of the hardware is really what, when we are talking about hardware supply chain, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things quickly. 
and and then I'm going to kind of like you know summarize them all together. But essentially, if you think about like the players in in hardware manufacturing, they're usually kind of like three players. Okay, there is the IP vendor. This is the 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 hardware designer. This is the one that actually designed the hardware. Maybe write the Verilog code, the HCL code, and and then kind of like you know make make the whole design happen. Uh, typically, this hard IP vendor could as, I, uh, either directly go into the manufacturer, which is the fabrication company, to build this hardware, or they usually go to the system integrator, and the system integrator goes to the manufacturer. The system integrator is the one that builds the entire system. So, for example, like a cell phone, like an iPhone that we have, it's a combination of many, many different chips, okay? And not all these chips has been designed and implemented by Apple. Many of them are actually outsourced to the other companies, okay? So for example, there's one company that's just do the power management for, for the cell phones. The other company that just do the Bluetooth design, like Qualcomm and Apple, they're like, you know, strategic, you know, partners. So the IP vendor is the company that builds the actual IP, for example, the codec, the, 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 the power management, the, the wireless, whatever. And the system integrator is that big company that kind of put these all together in order to build the entire system. And then they go to the manufacturer. The interesting thing is that all of these three players could be adversary for various different reasons, okay? Uh, the IP vendor might, you know, intentionally make some assumptions and, and put some you know malicious hardware inside their design in order to later on kind of like you know uh, achieve something malicious. The system integrator can do the same thing, or the system integrator can kind of try to bypass the IP vendor, kind of trying to uh, like reverse engineer or steal their information because. For every single IP that comes to the system integrator, the system integrator actually has to pay, right? So that's why you may want to have incentive to kind of like, you know, kind of double cross this, this IP vendor. And of course, manufacturer can, can do the same thing to either the system integrator or the IP vendor or both of them. So they can basically just design their own cell phones and sell their own cell phones, right? If, if they can. Uh, so the, all of these things can be untrusted. There could be mutual distrust between any two players. And unfortunately, there are lots of opportunities for the attacker in all of these. Uh, to give you a little bit more uh, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, background. So there is the IP vendor, which usually like send out the final file, which is like a GDS2, which we call. Then we send it to the, to the, to the foundry. And the attack that can happen here is essentially the IP piracy, right? So either the foundry or the system integrator can try to figure out what this IP is so that, you know, next time, instead of like asking this company to give the IP, they can actually design their IP themselves, right? Uh, the foundry can actually attack the system by overproducing the IC, right? So for example, Apple asked TSMC to give me like 1000s of this SOCs, uh, you know, uh, maybe TSMC decides to build 2000 of these and then keep the 1000 for themselves and sell it maybe in the black market or whatever, right? Because they have the, the, the capability of building them as many as they want and they can sell it as many as they want, right? And, and then another thing that the, the foundry or the IP designer can do is they can build defective or out of spec ICs, right? They can intentionally make the IC not to work to make some you know, malicious activities that they want. These are usually called Harvard Trojans. I'm gonna talk about that as well. And then, as I said, one thing that we can do when we are actually selling this in the market is not really selling the correct IC, but we're actually selling a recycled or age IC, right? So this is kind of the integrity issue parts that we, we talked about, okay? So these are different ways of kind of like this chip production flow can be kind of attacked at different players in this in the system. Uh, so what we need to do as one of the ways of kind of protecting this is what we call hardware metering, okay? So hardware metering means that uh, as the IP owner, you may want to kind of figure out how many of these chips has been produced or at least be able to kind of track where these hardware are, how many of, of, of these hardware that have actually been produced is yours, how many of them have been, you know, 
pirated and overproduced and things like that. So kind of like having some idea of what has been designed. And since this design is actually is out of your hand, right? So the IP designed the IP, but then need, they need to send it to the fab. And here they have no idea of what's going on in the fab. Of course, there are two different companies. They can talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera. But if they don't trust each other for various political or, or you know, other reasons, uh, they have no kind of transparency of what's going on within this fab. What they will see is that there are a bunch of different ICs. But as I said, the, this fab could easily overproduce this. So instead of three, they can make six, right? So they need to kind of meter kind of figure out how many of these has been designed, or if they see this hardware in the market, they can at least should be able to tell which one is ours, which one is the ones that we actually intended to fabricate versus which one of these are actually overproduced by the fab company, okay? So we kind of need an idea of an electric chip ID, so ECID or something like that, that I can see that within the electronic device and say, okay, boom, this is mine. This is like 0001, this is 0002, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So kind of like a, a, a number associated to it. So how do we do that? So this is just generally this idea of hardware metering. Uh, so it, you know the, the a more formal description of this is that you know set of security protocols that enables the IP owner to achieve kind of post fabrication co control over the IP, right? So once the devices are back, you know now know that which one you have designed and which one you haven't designed. Of course, the fab might not give you the overproduced ones and they sell it in the market. But if you go to the market and kind of like, you know, randomly check them, you should be able to, for example, detect which one is yours and which one is not, right? There are two main methods for, for doing this. There is an active metering method and there is a passive metering method. I'm gonna give you an example of each one. There are a whole bunch of, you know, different ways within active and passive. We don't have time to go over them. If you're interested, definitely go and read more about them. So the passive metering is actually, one way of passive metering is exactly using PUFs, okay? So the idea is that I told you already that PUF, these are device independent, you know, device dependent. They are unique for each device. So what I can do is that if I'm able to kind of predict that, okay, for device A, so I can like have a database of Device one, this is this should be the response. Device two, this should be the response, and so on and so forth. And then since these your responses are unique, there are two things I can do for this. One is that for any given device post fabrication, I can send the challenge and see what is the response, and say that okay, this should be device one or two. So I can identify which device is which. The second thing I can do is that. If this has been overproduced, then there will be some other devices that is not in my database, right? So I'm gonna have these others that I don't know what the response is. So the moment I see a response that is not part of my database, I know that, aha, uh -huh, this is the device that wasn't supposed to be fabricated, right? Because I don't have it in my database. So it's kind of like, you know, kind of detecting this unauthorized devices using, uh, the PUS, okay? Uh, you kind of like, you know, the tagging this, and this is kind of like, you know, goes into what we call a functional identification of, of the device. This goes into a passive method because essentially this is not something that, you know, actively within the actual activity of the device we are using it. Usually PUF has its own internal and external inputs and outputs. You just need to kind of figure out how to send the challenge and how to receive the challenge. And this way you can basically ID this device. Okay. Any questions here? The other alternative is active metering. Uh, the idea of active metering is uh, that uh, you want to have kind of a communication between the IP owner and the foundry. And, and you can have like an internal kind of uh, active metering or an external active metering. Uh, so the basic idea is this, that we're gonna have some kind of internal states within the design that if I have the key, then I can actually kind of uh, activate those states, okay? So for example, like, you know, 
basically the inputs of my my gate would be something like you know the key and the output like the input and then based on the value of the key then this outputs like you know a series of this you know gates and then collection of them will result in a particular output that only i know what that output should look like only if i i send the correct set of keys okay so for example if i send zero 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 I know that this should result in a particular output that I know of. And the fact that I'm the designer, I'm the only one who knows how this design works and have the keys for that design, then I should be able to predict that, okay? So this way I can, I can then change it for various different you know, designs and then have different keys for each one. And then I'm gonna apply the key and see the response and say, okay, this key corresponds to this device, the other key corresponds to that device and so on and so forth. So I'm kind of actively looking at this values in order to protect the system. There's a whole bunch of you know, uh, in, in interesting uh, 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 ways of, of, of doing that. Like how do we do create this space and state, how we actually you know, apply the key, et cetera, et cetera. If you're again interested, go and take a look at these papers just the basic very very high level idea is that you can design your system such that there is this hidden you know states and hidden inputs that only you as a designer know where they are and you as a designer know which key corresponds to that state and this way you can actually kind of apply this and find these values okay questions uh, finally, there is uh, there is this epic idea that basically uh, uh, you know we're going to talk about next week. Uh, I'm not going to go through it so that we can we can actually talk about it. But generally, it's very similar to what I said. But this time, you can actually have kind of a control over any different output that you want in the system. So basically you add the key in many, many different parts of your, your circuit. And, and then, you know, by knowing which key corresponds to what device, then you can actually unlock that device, knowing the output of that device and, and break it. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, let's, talk, let's give the, the presenter to talk about this next week, and then we can have a more discussion about this. Are you guys presenting? Yeah. Okay. So. No pressure. Thank you. All right. So, so this is kind of like the idea of what we say hardware metering. If you remember, I said that essentially the idea of hardware metering is being able to know what's happening to my device, being able to identify these devices from each other. Okay. So active or passive, POF or using some form of a key-based design. That's kind of like the idea. Uh, the other thing that we need to be worried about is piracy, right? So, uh, so the idea of a piracy is that you know uh, the IP could be cloned, could be overproduced, or could be reverse engineered, right? So, and as I said, either the system integrator can do this to the IP owner, or the fabrication company can do this to either system integrator or the IP owner. And uh, so we need to be able to also kind of like prevent these things from happening as well. Uh, so first of all, why hardware IPs, why IPs is being used in hardware design? Because you want to do, you know, system on chips, you want to do design reuse, right? So usually, as I said, like, you know, in complex systems such as like a cell phone or a laptop, you have many, many different ICs, okay? And it's very costly and very complex that if all these ICs are just one monolithic IC, you usually put it into various different things. You modularize the, your design and say, okay, this is the IP that is only supposed to do something with radio frequencies. The other IC is responsible for audio or video. The other IC is for power management. The other IC is for memory. So different ICs for different things. And as I said, since the cost of designing these things is very huge, one company usually don't build all of them together. So they typically kind of like, you know, find the third parties for doing them for them, okay? Although, for example, companies like Apple these days are trying to kind of going back to the traditional method of they're building everything themselves. But most of the companies, they're not, they're only a system integrity. They're really not building anything 
themselves. They're just outsourcing all these, uh, you know, different chips to different companies. And then together, they just integrate them all together. Okay. Uh, as I said, the, the, the system, the players are IP designer, integrator, and foundries. Uh, and what is a what is a hardware IP? The hardware IP could be the just as simple as the Verilog or HDL codes. It could be the GDS2, could be the Netlist, could be the layout, could be even the technique of description, not even the implementation. So all of these things could be essentially hardware IP. If you're like more familiar with digital design, you know this terminology is a little bit better. Uh, so different ways of hardware IPs is like soft IPs, which are generally just the HDL codes, which means that anybody who has that HDL codes can generally gen generate that IP. The more firm IPs are like, you know, actual place and routes, RTL designs, and then hard IPs are actually the final GDS2 file. Again, these are different in the terminologies. If you're a little bit familiar with digital design, if you're not, don't bother. It's just different things that you can design IPs in your system, okay? So, so what are the vulnerabilities? Uh, so the vulnerabilities is that you can reverse engineer these IPs, whether it's soft or hard or, 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 or GDS2 file. You can overproduce the hard IPs. The hard IPs are usually hard to reverse engineer. Uh, sometimes you can, but most of the times you can just overproduce them. And then uh, you can clone the soft IPs. You can you can reverse engineer soft IPs, or you can, uh, uh, as I said, uh, overproduce them. Uh, uh, and then these are these are some of the examples. So, for example, for for over usage, the system integrator could be the attacker. For IP modification, uh, the attacker could be either the system integrator or the, the designer itself. Uh, for cloning, again, the, the attacker could be the, uh, the system uh, integrator. And overproduction is usually the attacker is the, is the foundry. Um, uh, again, on, on, uh, on the reverse engineering side, uh, 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 the the hardware you know the building of the hardware could be uh, could be defined uh, based on some regulatories. Sometimes it's legal and sometimes it's not legal. In most cases, it's not legal to overproduce or clone or reverse engineer. So uh, so typically there are some laws and rules to kind of like help that. And again, the 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 the, the relationship between the companies can help in order to protect your system from. Uh, from being attacked. But as I said, these days, given that kind of like the political relationship between these traditional players are kind of breaking because usually the designs, uh, you know, the IP designers are mostly in China and East Asia. The, the fabrication companies are, are mostly, you know, used to be US and other company countries, but these days only 18% of uh, the chips that are being used in U.S. is actually manufactured in U.S., and more than 80% of the chips are manufactured outside, mainly by TSMC. And then the system integrator is usually within U.S. So there's a whole bunch of these kind of clash between these different countries and different regions that cause these problems and cause this issue. Okay, and then not only that, there's also a competition between different system integrators, right? So, for example, Apple and Samsung and 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 ARM and et cetera, et cetera. So they can have also have these problems with each other. Okay. Uh, so how do we actually protect these systems? Uh, uh, so we do different things. Uh, prevention or pr protection is usually done by actually putting some kind of like, you know, uh, uh, ways such that this design cannot be overproduced. Uh, you know, chemicals could be like, you know, the, the whole manufacturing process could be very useful in this case. Uh, obfuscation and, uh, and hardware obfuscation is really helpful. So the idea of hardware obfuscation is like, you know, the IP piracy paper that you guys are gonna present is actually useful here as well, which essentially you're not really able to reverse engineer this because in order to reverse engineer this, you need to kind of find a particular key and then you cannot find that key. So you cannot you know, design the system. And another thing that you can do is that some form of expiration of service, which for example, you can have some form of a kill switch within your design that if you decide that your design has to be kind of inactive for any reason, 
For example, you figure out that you know your system has been pirated or, or somebody has overproduced your system. If you have some form of a kill switch within your design, then you can deactivate that all of your designs, right? So you may actually want to, to kind of, as a designer, kind of predict that this might happen in future to so kind of have something. And finally, encryption of the design itself. So the actual design, for example, the bitstream that you use for FVGAs typically are encrypted. So uh, only the, the person or the, the entity that has the key to the decryption can, can decrypt this design. Any other person who sees this design cannot understand anything about it because similar to any message, the design itself is encrypted. So, so essentially, this is as safe as sending a message over the air using radio you know, communication and so on and so forth. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of you know, research and interesting work on how we can do encryption for, for the designs and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's it with the secure IP. Again, uh, next week when we are talking about uh, the, 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 the epic paper, both of these things make a little bit more sense, and then we can we can revisit this and talk a little bit more about it. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's talk about another concept, and that is hardware trojans. So this is the part that you know we're not trying to overproduce or clone, but as a designer or the system integrator or even the fab, you actually add additional functionality to the system such that the system no longer you know does what it's supposed to do okay or what it was advertised to do okay uh so these are intentional changes to the design at various different stages uh in order to to do something malicious okay so this is kind of like you know uh, this kind of analogy is your expectation is getting us getting hardware that is error free but free works all the time but in reality because of all these trust issues that we have the hardware is not doing what it's supposed to uh so as i said the the more formal definition of hardware trojans is this intentional hardware modification in uh, you know intentional malicious modification in hardware uh and the biggest questions about hardware trojan is this three questions where when and how okay so, so when it can happen is that usually it happens during the design time or it can happen during the, during the manufacturer time. Uh, examples, as I said, if, for example, we are making a contract like Apple is having a third party IP designer that's kind of not really legitimate. It's kind of like iffy uh, IP designer. They might decide to kind of like, you know, put something in that design to extract some information. Actually, there's a very interesting story that's never been confirmed. It's a big hack that I'm going to actually talk about in the next few slides. That's actually one of these things that goes into Amazon Web Services and kind of, you know, impacted lots of services uh, of servers of, of Amazon. Uh, manufacturing could happen as well. So essentially, if you look at this kind of like, you know, pattern, uh, the Trojans could be happen during the the design integration logic synthesis, or it could happen during the fabrication, okay? Uh, so what are the examples of hardware trojans? I'm showing a very simple example of how a hardware trojan can be actually implemented. So let's say you have like an, uh, a, a NOR uh, 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 design here, something like this. Uh, so what will happen here is that this is, for example, what you are supposed to get. Okay, as a designer, you thought that you're designing this basic gate, okay, that has input A and B and it has the output C. What will happen is that uh, either the system integrator, the manufacturer, or the designer adding these two additional gates to, to your one gate system. One of them is the trigger and the other one is a payload. And as a result, this C now becomes C modified, and this part is then connected to the rest of the network. So what will happen here is that, for example, if you look at the examples here, first of all, this trigger almost all the time is equal to zero, unless both of them becomes one and one, okay? So in most cases, 
either 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, or 0, 0, this is equal to 0, which this is equal to 0, and XOR of C and, and 0 is always C. So in other words, if the trigger is not activated, the output of C modified is exactly as C. Nothing changes, okay? So that's why where the trigger is kind of coming to the play. The moment that both of these becomes one, then this becomes a one. And what will happen is that X or of one with anything would be the inverted version of that. So basically the C modified becomes the inverted of, of C, okay? Which means that if I expecting one, now I'm getting zero. If I'm expecting zero, now I'm getting one. And this only happens if this trigger gets activated, okay? So in other words, Trojans are these modifications, that combination of a trigger and a payload, that what it does is that under some rare condition in most cases, it changed the output of your circuit, okay? And this output of the circuit, now think about this, that if this is part of your key, or if this is part of the privilege escalation, like this decide whether you are root level privileges or user level privileges, right? So if you manage to actually put this Trojan in the right place in your circuit, then what you would be able to do is changing lots of things all the way to the, to the software. Same idea when you were talking about faults and say that, okay, I can flip a bit. And by flipping the bits, I can, you know, change a key or change finding the ciphertext, et cetera, et cetera. Same idea here. If I put this in the right place, then I can actually do something malicious. Uh, and then this trigger part is essentially just helping the attacker to stay stealthy, stay invisible for most of the time. Because this trigger only gets activated under certain conditions, which means that in most cases, I cannot even detect that there is such an attack. There is such a Trojan in the system. In other words, most of the cases, the Trojans stay dormant and stay inactive, but only under very tiny circumstances it becomes active. And that's a powerful thing for the adversary because the adversary knows the condition for the trigger to be launched. And what they can do is that they can send that input at the right time and right place to attack the system. For example, there is uh, uh, there are reports that there's this missile systems uh, uh, in in Middle East that you know there was this Trojan that they become inactive right when the you know the planes was like flying over them, right? So there are there are like things like this that can happen that you can activate this. You can basically this is kind of like a long term kind of attacks that you can manage to build this hardware, sell it to your victims. And, and what can, you can do is that wait for this to, for the right time and then activate this kind of, uh, uh, kind of attacks, okay? But of course, you can actually not have a trigger and just directly change the, the logics. Nothing prevents you from doing that. There are actually Trojans like that in real world that essentially they just change the logic so that every time that you're sending, for example, zero, zero, you're expecting to get one, but you're getting zero or, or the other way around. Uh, so this is kind of like a very basic example of how a Trojan could work. Uh, so you might ask, okay, where do I add this Trojan? There are examples that people have shown that, for example, you can add it to, to the CPU to change the logic. You can have added to RF modules to change it. Actually, one of the papers I think next week is about uh, a hardware Trojans that have been added to the radio you know, uh, uh, of, of the system. And they showed that, for example, this could be used to eavesdrop the system or to, to, to create a covert channel, things like that you can do with this kind of uh, uh, additional uh, changes to the, to the system. Uh, other components like crypto modules could be also impacted. So generally Trojans could be added to any part of the system. As long as you have, you know, control over where and how your additional circuits and gates are going to be inserted, okay? Questions? And then, so where to add is like, you can basically add it anywhere. What to add is also could be anything, uh, but basically three things that you want to consider. One is that you want to add as little as possible. Why? Because 
the more that you add, the chances that it can be detected is, is more, right? So you want to have the minimal amount of change that gives you something that you want. So you want to do enough that gives you something, you know, notable, something dangerous. And then usually you want to add a trigger. The reason for trigger, as I said, is because without trigger, your system always creating that fault. But with the trigger, most of the time it doesn't. So it's even harder for any sort of tests on the system because there's nothing, nothing has changed. So from outside, there's no difference between the Trojan afflicted samples and not you know, clean and safe samples because both of them are not active in terms of attack, okay? Uh, so how serious is this? As I said, only 18% of the chips, global manufactured chips in, within US. And unfortunately, manufacturing itself is very, very, you know, very, very expensive. So for all of these military systems, uh, all of these critical infrastructures and anything like that that we put in our, you know, critical, you know, infrastructure within this country, we're exposing ourselves to this kind of Trojan attacks, right? Because these are, you know, being manufactured overseas, of course, you may want to manufacture it when, when the, where the, you know, you have some allies and you kind of like you make sure that it's secure, but the process is so complex that you cannot actually have that all the time. Okay. So that's, that's a big problem. Uh, to give you an example, this is the story of big hack. So the big hack is this like tiny little chip that's, you know, shown here uh, that, you know, uh, Bloomberg Business Week uh, claimed that this actually happened, and a small Chinese company managed to add this to servers in AWS that ended up in in CIA and NSA and all those big companies. Uh, and then they they kind of claimed that they listened to lots of communications and send out those communications. Although both White House and CIA always ignore and, and rejected this idea and say that this is not true, but you know, this is actually, you can actually search through Bloomberg and read this idea uh, and let it for you guys to decide whether it's true or not. But what happened was based on that uh, report, they showed that there are actually this big racks of servers that goes to AWS you know, server rooms. They showed that this tiny little chip and actually sits on the motherboard can basically you know, intercept and record some of the communications within the chip, uh, including lots of communications for the RF module. And, and this module basically goes into you know, the server racks and the server racks are servicing lots of different applications, including you know, user level applications, company level applications, and critical level applications as well. Uh, so that's, yeah, as I said, this is kind of like, you know, an example of this actually can happen in real world. And, and we need to be careful about these kind of things. Questions? Yeah. You, you said that the chip records like RF information, but it's on a server rack. I guess I am curious, like what would be the benefit of putting it on RF when there would probably be a lot of information shared over RF when you're dealing with servers, would you? No, no, no. So this is on the motherboard. So basically this motherboard company was the culprit in this case. And they added this extra chip that it was, I think, recording all the kind of communication. And they were also able to communicate through the internet to the RF channel. Okay, so so they're listening to all the communications within the cores, recorded, and that sometimes they manage to actually kind of extract that so information. Been, been yeah. Yes, yeah. So they say that tons of data actually been sent out. Of course, the, 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 this uh, particular article has been reviewed lots of times by US government. So in fact, most people believe it's not true. Any other questions? Uh, so is this a get any better? Any of these things, the IP piracy, overproduction, uh, hybrid trojans? And unfortunately, the answer is no. 
uh, because we are going more and more toward heterogeneity, which means that we are not only reducing the amount of like our reliance on these different IPs, but actually increasing our reliance to these different IPs uh, because the nodes get more expensive. So we cannot really manufacture things here. We need to outsource the manufacturing. Uh, designing hardware is very expensive. You also want to outsource that to like cheaper places. Uh, new technology is coming. And again, this this technology is usually more global. So essentially, we are same as many other things. We are shifting toward more globalism, which means that you know the opportunity for an attacker in these systems becomes even higher. Okay. Uh, so how do we detect Trojans? Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on talking about that as well. Uh, so the first thing that you can do is physical inspection, okay? Uh, so essentially, uh, since hardware Trojan is like, you know, either the IP manufacturer system integrator or the fab company can add things to their system, as the final user, you can basically inspect what is there. For example, for that big hack idea, you can actually look into the server and kind of identify every single component in the system. And if you can do that, maybe you can be able to say that, okay, what is this? And I don't know what this is. And then you can take it out and see that, okay, this is something that is happening. Uh, this process is usually very invasive because you have to actually kind of, kind of like remove the layers and layers from the system. You have to take out the, you know, different chips from the motherboards. Within the chips, you need to, you know, destroy each metal layers from it. Uh, you need to do some form of image processing or microscoping, you know, signal processing. Uh, and, but ultimately you can, you know, recover the entire net list, list of, you know, uh, 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 circuits and gates in the system. There are lots of works in this domain uh, using very high-end technologies to do that, but that's one of the ways that you can you can detect hardware atrocious, okay? But this means that the, the particular device that you're looking at is going to be destroyed. So usually the idea here is that, for example, I'm going to order 1,000s of these chips. I'm going to, for example, randomly pick 10 of them. I'm going to do the physical inspection of these 10. If there if there nothing happens with them, I'm kind of know that the other 999 is okay as well, right? So it's kind of more of a sampling approach, right? Uh, but of course, there's no guarantee that all of them are square. Uh, uh, the other less invasive solution is functional verification, because essentially what you can do is that since adding Trojan essentially changed the logic, right? So the ultimate goal of the Trojan is that changing the functionality, I can actually test my functionality before actually using it, right? So I can create lots of test patterns, send it to the device. If I know what the correct answer should be, then I can basically just check that, right? So for example, for that particular example, if I know that this is the gate that I'm looking at, I'm gonna send all the four possibilities of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and see the output. The moment I see that this output is not what I expect, I know that something happened with this. Of course, this is very lengthy and complex process because we are talking about billions of gates, not just one gate, but there are ways that we can, we can do this as well, okay? Uh, another way that you can do this that is a little bit easier than just doing a pure you know, verification is the idea of using side channels. So the idea here is that if I know what is my reference data devices. So for example, I know that if I build this hardware, uh, the Trojan free version of this hardware should be this device A. So now what I can do is that the next time I build this other hardware, uh, like, you know, C, B, and C, and D, what I can do is that I can compare the physical signals of these devices with this device. The idea here is that if somebody adds additional logic to the system, their power, the temperature, the electromagnetic emanations, the power fluctuations, these things that's coming out of this device will be different than this device. So these two will not be the same because these are physically two different hardware. One has more logics than the other, or one is doing different processing than the other. And as a result, uh, uh, I can detect the difference, okay? So similar to kind of like the way that we do malware detection, but this is more at the 
pure hardware physical layer. So I'm kind of detecting the difference in physical characteristics of these two devices. If I can detect that, I can detect atrocious. Okay? Questions? Uh, the other idea is the idea of what we call split manufacturing. This is also something that you're going to have a paper next week. But the idea is this, that, you know, I'm going to design my IP. I'm going to send it to the manufacturer, right? And since the manufacturer has complete, you know, control over the IP, they can pick, for example, this part and change this part, okay? So what I can do is that, I'm gonna split this manufacturing into a bunch of different manufacturers. So I'm not gonna send the entire design to one fab. I'm gonna, you know, make you know smaller components. This is IP one, this is two. This is still the same IP, but it's just I'm just breaking it down into different pieces. And then I'm gonna send it to company one, company two, and company three. And each one then build it. The idea is that even if one of these three is kind of malicious, since they don't have control over the entire IP, the logics that they add to the system won't work because it needs to be connected to other things, right? So the entire things needs to be malicious, you know, needs to be modified in order for this to work. So if only one is adding, for example, a gate, even some gates, this gate is not connected to anything else. So it's kind of like it's just additional gates not connected to anywhere else. So the idea here is that maybe this way I can find one manufacturer that is trusted and then I can be a little bit easier in terms of finding other manufacturers. I can find, you know, maybe cheaper manufacturers that are a little bit iffy. Even if they add something, it's not going to go anywhere because the rest of the, the system is trusted and controlled by me. Okay, so this is kind of the idea of what's called split manufacturing because we're not sending manufacturing to one fabrication company. I'm sending it to multiple of them. And the idea is that if they don't collude with each other, of course, if they all collude with each other, then this won't work. This will break as well because then they can say that, okay, I'm going to add this and you add that and you add that and together it's going to work. But if one of them at least is, is trusted, then this system is guaranteed to be secure. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a paper reading and paper presentation next week about this. So you're going to actually see the details of this. Any questions? Great. Uh, so what are the challenges? There are three main challenges in detecting hardware trojans. The first one and the biggest one is the golden model. Uh, remember I told you that usually what you need to know is that you should know the expected behavior, right? So you need to know the expected behavior to detect the difference. But in order to know the expected behavior, you need to have the Trojan free model, which we usually call the golden model. But in many cases, this is a chicken egg problem kind of thing, right? You don't have access to the Trojan free problem, you know, model. If you don't have access to the Trojan free model, you don't know what is the expected behavior. So you cannot really apply this things to it right so so in many cases you can assume but in many other cases you cannot assume that you you have access to the golden model so for example things like this only works that i know what this is if i don't have this then it's really nothing i can do with this right so there's nothing that i can compare to to know that okay this is expected or not so in some cases is is helpful in many cases it's not helpful the second problem is the existence of dormant Trojan. As I said, for example, for this side channel like base detection, the assumption here is if the Trojan becomes active, then this signal and this signal are not the same. But if the Trojan is not active, it's dormant, then these two signals will be similar because essentially they're doing the same thing, right? So not only I have to kind of be able to measure the difference between these two, I have to be able to somehow activate this Trojan in this, in this device, okay? So that's an additional problem. This is a coverage problem that I have that I need to somehow manage to not only find the Trojan, but also activate that Trojan. That's why having a trigger is very, very helpful for the adversary because the adversary can only pick 
the right inputs at the right time. And many other instances, the Trojan is not even active. So you cannot see any difference between the Trojan and the normal behavior. And finally, the, the second, the third problem is the unknown unknown problem, which means that there are some un known unknowns, which means that I know that I don't know something, uh, but I have a way of finding it, okay? So this is a, a known unknown problem. But the unknown unknown problem is that I don't even know that what I don't know, right? So I don't even know that some of these devices might be Trojan afflicted and how can I actually detect them? Or if I don't have access to the golden model, then I can don't have even the ground truth for detecting the, 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 uh, 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 the, the differences, right? So the unknown unknown problem is a big, big challenge in many of the systems. And generally in security, this unknown unknown problem is a big, big challenge. Because many things, we have no idea that how they work and what's problem, what sort of problems even we have to look for then be able to you know, propose a solution for that, okay? All right, so uh, to summarize, there's one more thing that I need to discuss, but I think we don't have much time. I'm gonna just give you two slides for it, and then, uh, and then next time we can talk about it. So if you remember, I said three problems with hardware security, integrity, the counterfeit, and age hardware, that's number one. The second one is the information leakage, the IP piracy, uh, the reverse engineer. In order to protect this, you do things like hardware metering and, and uh, IP protection. And the first one was uh, the intentional manipulation, which was this harbor Trojans. Uh, sorry. This harbor Trojans that I talked about. And then, uh, and then faults we actually talked about before. The last thing that we haven't talked about this, this design box. So the last thing I want to talk about is, is the issue of design box. Uh, let me just give you very quickly what this is about. There's a little bit of details that you need to know that I'm gonna probably just uh, you know record a video and send it to you. So if you think about the way that we enforce security in our computer hardware, uh, there are two things that we do. One is the principle of least privilege. We essentially, we say that, you know, everybody has access to the things that they should have access and nothing else, right? So we have to kind of need to uh, authorize different tasks, authorize access and things like that, right? And, and, and this, this usually typically leads to separation of a user and a root. In some cases, there are multiple ranks, like, you know, there is, hardware and, and a machine and so on and so forth. But at the very least, you have to have a user and a root, and then these two shouldn't have kind of like, you know, talk to each other. Uh, the second thing is isolation, which means that if I have multiple processes, uh, if I assign, for example, memory, the memory should be isolated. So for example, this part has to be accessed by this process, but if this process tries to access this part, it should be blocked. Because if this process can read things from this part of the memory, which belongs to this process, then essentially we are saying that all the secrets from the other process can be accessed by the other process, right? So you want to have isolation to make sure that nobody can read each other's data, okay? And this is a very important principle in computer security that we should not be able, you should not allow the system to kind of like, you know, access each other's processes data, okay? Or for example, if there's some secret data that belongs to the root, the user level should not be able to access this, okay? So this is how we kind of like, you know, make sure to maintain security. Typically, in most cases, the operating system is the one who is handling all these things. Uh, but you know, for a system that doesn't have an operating system, either the hardware or the software helps helps us with this, okay? Uh, and then the final thing is the trusted computing base, right? So the, the idea of secure boot and the fact that we start the trust from some base and we kind of expand this base such that we expand the trust, right? Uh, uh, and we basically only verify TCB, make sure our TCB is safe, and everything else is verified by the TCB. But if the TCB itself is broken, then the entire system is broken, okay? 
So these things is, is like the basic things that we build everything on top of it. So all the software and network and, and communication, everything that we say based on these three main components, okay? But as I said, there might be bugs, there might be issues that these three may not actually work, okay? So the isolation specifically can be broken by, by these hardware bugs that we might have. So what are they? They're basically a combination of some wrong assumptions that we have about hardware and some side channels, digital side channels can actually combine together in order to break the system. Uh, this is what I'm gonna like, you know, talk about in a short video that I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, post later. Uh, we're gonna talk about this transient execution attacks and, and, and how it can combine with digital side channels in order to break these, these three fundamental assumptions. So, and once we break these three, then nothing works because this is like our, our kind of foundation of computer security. Okay, any questions? All right, um, so I'm gonna go to here. Let's see. Uh, today we got side channels. Actually, we're gonna do meltdown. Okay, thank you guys. So no class on Monday, okay?